Bem-vindos à terceira jornada dos nossos queridos para cuidar. Uh, É para nós, enfim, uma, uma honra manifesta e um assumido prazer com, com o que pedimos da professora doutora Teresa Martinho Tolli. A professora Teresa Tolli é professora catedrática da Universidade de Fernando Pessoa, do Porto, licenciada em Mestre em Teologia Sistemática da Universidade Católica Portuguesa, realizou seus estudos doutorais em Frankfurt, na Alemanha, em Teologia Feminista. Ainda pode doutorada pelo Centro de Sociais do Sociado de Pimbra, onde integra a linha de investigação Democracia, Justiça e Direitos Humanos. Está ainda implicada na coordenação do Grupo de Trabalho Policrevos, Observatório da Religião no Espaço Público. Foi decidida Presidente da Associação Portuguesa de Estudos sobre as Mulheres, entre 2009 e 2014. Integra, naturalmente, o Conselho Editorial de várias revistas da especialidade ligadas aos seus interesses, pesquisa de ensino, a ética, a política, a religião, naturalmente, os direitos humanos, os direitos das mulheres, as teologias feministas e, é, e os estudos de género. Delineado o percurso intelectual e, diria mesmo, militante da doutora Teresa Tolli, suscita-nos esta ideia, talvez impertinente, estulta, mas certamente heterodoxa, se não mesmo herética, de que a revelação sobrenatural declarada encerrada pela tradição, na verdade continua e prolonga-se na relação dita e natural com a qual misteriosamente se entrelaça. E por isto, por meio, isto, por meio do esforço meditativo e da perseverança ativista de mulheres e homens, em cuja experiência religiosa o sentido inabalável da transcendência e o mais urgente compromisso com a imanência se dialetizam. Mas nestas falas da solicitude e do cuidado, perguntar-se-á por que dar voz a uma teóloga? Sim, porque, e posso dizer, tudo começou com uma tese pioneira em Portugal, em teologia feminista, que em 1998, em 98, perdão, deu origem ao livro Deus e a palavra de Deus na teologia feminista, nas edições paulinas. Nesta obra desenvolve-se uma atividade crítica do paradigma androcêntrico do catolicismo, sem todavia cair no escolho oposto e simétrico da teologia do ginocentrismo igualmente redutor. Mas algo é certo. Trata-se, nessa obra, de denunciar criticamente todas as formas dogmáticas e eclesiais que constituam modos de exclusão, subalternização ou humilhação das mulheres. Por que então solicitar a voz de uma teóloga? Perguntava. Porque os desenlaços pós-modernos e os desenvolvimentos hiper-modernos da nossa contemporaneidade, estão atravessados por um paradoxo a três termos que a pessoa Teresa Tolli ajuda a deslindar. Por um lado, encontramos o discurso do desenvolvimento do mundo, que de Max Weber e Marcelo Gaucher alegam a extenuação das narrativas religiosas e a secularização do espaço social. Por outro, enfrentamos o recrudescer de múltiplos fundamentalismos condicionais, não apenas o islâmico, com as consequências trágicas de violência e morte que nos assolam, mas também, há que dizer o de algumas igrejas neo-evangélicas ou interfações ultraconservadoras do catolicismo que lançam mão da anti-ideologia do género e sustentam projetos políticos autoritários. Mas isto acresce à associação da já antiga, velha, New Age, ao culto do desenvolvimento pessoal, a evado de sincretismo religioso, de psicologia tita positiva, e de uma pseudo espiritualidade ao serviço, na verdade, do mais imediato hedonismo e individualismo materialistas de um certo ocidente. Ao ler Teresa Tolle, encontramos recursos para pensar criticamente este diagnóstico e recordamos que a experiência religiosa é uma experiência fundamental de emancipação e de abertura à autoridade. A autoridade do homem vulnerável, próximo ao longínquo, e à autoridade do divino. E isto, ousando abandonar a posição hegemónica e enfrentar a diversidade étnica, cultural e constitucional numa atitude de diálogo ecumênico. Teresa Tolle ousa propor um vasto programa, uma teologia interreligiosa da libertação, que assume os desafios da ideologia de género, 
o estudo de género, o combate à opressão e à pobreza, a luta contra a destruição dos recursos naturais e da nossa casa comum. E para tal, preconiza, promove um ecofeminismo que não seja um essencialismo feminista verde. Uma teoria e uma prática do cuidado social e politicamente empenhado e espiritualmente orientado. O que nos ensina, pelo exemplo de Teresa Tolli, é que nenhuma doutrina salvífica, nenhuma escatologia da promessa, dispensou empenho, aqui e agora, pela minoria das condições de vida dos povos e oprimidos, pela promoção do cuidado e da emancipação em sentido largo. Esperamos que tais propostas teóricas, ousadas e desafiadoras, tenham o efeito borboleta de que a nossa ilustre convidada nos fala num dos seus artigos. Tem a palavra a doutora Teresa Tolby, com uma conferência intitulada Dancing on the Age of the Abyss. Uh, bom dia, uh, then I will turn to English, ok? Just, since the presentation was in Portuguese. Uh, eu agradeço imenso e fiquei aterrada porque uh, eu, o meu texto não sei se vai corresponder às expectativas. <laughs> <laughs> e quanto mais eu estou a falar, mais eu entrava em pânico e pensava, ai meu Deus, que isto não vai, não vai ser mais especial. So, Good morning, everybody. I was saying that I was really scared. So, because after this generous presentation, I thought what I'm going to say is little, well, it won't fit. It, uh, so, it won't be as uh, good developed. And uh, sorry, it was a text I presented that I didn't know that I would have such a beautiful presentation. <laughs> okay. So, So, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It is an honor and it is a joy and pleasure to be here and to share some thoughts uh, with such an interesting and uh, unengaged audience. You don't mind if I, if I speak sitting. You, you can see me, don't you? Because I'm little and, uh, okay, I prefer to talk like this. Okay, so let me start with the story. It is a story from a TV series called Wakefield. Wakefield is a psychiatric ward situated in the Australian Blue Mountains. Every each chapter of Wakefield starts with the psych nurse, Nick, standing at the edge of an abyss in those mountains or dreaming about it. He is a nurse that according with Christine Dunphy, the creator of the drama series, has a gift. A gift for soothing the afflicted and reaching the unreachable. Nick is the go-to man in emergencies, combining expertise with intuition in moments in which no one seems to know how to control violence, despair, isolation, self-denial, addictive behaviors of various types, drugs, sex, gambling, fears of loneliness. He acts and speaks with patients, aware of the condition of each and every one of them, and aware of the failures existing in the site ward near to the Australian Blue Mountains Abyss. He knows that there are lives, relationships, families and jobs of all the characters, pride, sense of self-worth or self, sense the self-unworth that contextualize the various behaviors of the patients. But Nick's spe special gift reveals itself in his capacity to connect with others, interacting at the same time as a psych nurse and as a person that patients need and on, not only patients. Nick sees them as people and not only as cases of a, specific, of a specific mental illness. However, along the series, we do not only see pathologies in the patients. Actually, carers of those people, nurses, psychiatrists, bureaucratic staff, are also wounded people. Christine Dunphy draws our attention to the fact that patients are being cared for by staff who often have mental health issues of their own. There is a nurse insecure of her position as chief nurse, always malicious 
manipulative, actually someone with no life outside the clinic, someone who invests the existence of a dependent doctor as an excuse to her bitterness and incapacity to have compassion for patients and friendship with the colleagues, someone who does nothing in order to improve a young a patient in a catatonic situation, since this assures his dependence on her. There is also a doctor with a terrible sense of direction that gets helplessly lost on a regular basis. A naive carer who is a single mother of two and just wants to be loved and approved in her generosity. A young psychiatrist terrified of his patients drowning in anxiety and despair. A nurse who is indifferent to everyone around him, insensitive, morbidly cynical and blatantly inconsiderate. Next, so this um, side nurse uh, leaves his day-to-day -day life trying to improve the clinic situation of the patients using simple and discreet psychological techniques mixed with the sensibility that enables him to interact with them as human beings, recognizing and appealing to what they have in common with him, precisely the fact that both the clinic staff and the patients are wounded humans. However, there is something mysterious in Nick's life. He keeps reminding him on and on a specific song, something that he's not able to understand until the day his hidden memories of a tragedy in his family's past hits him, strikes him in such a brutal way that Nick, the go-to man in emergencies, falls into a psychiatric serious crisis. The song he kept hearing was a song that was playing on the radio while he was bathing his younger brother in his childhood. The radio fell into the bathtub and killed his little brother with an electric shock. The remembrance of that, the past that emerges from Nick's hidden memories while her sister has a, a, a conversation with him during her wedding was the effect, has the effect of an avalanche. The series ends with Nick in the miserable situation of some of the worst patients before the eyes of a horrified staff. After all, what Christine Dunphy wanted to point out with this series was that there's a fine line between sanity and madness. Sanity and madness are things that go far beyond a simple clinic situation. My aim is not to speak specifically about this tiny line between sanity and madness, so I'm not a psychologist. I use this example as a symbol for the vulnerability that is common to every and each human being. We are all at the edge of an abyss, the abyss of not being totally able to cope with situations that hurt us, the abyss of mortality, the abyss of being those experiences of a radical vulnerability at the edge of an abyss leave open wounds. Actually, Professor João Mariande, in his extremely interesting text about the relationship between an anthropology of vulnerability and the ethics of care, reminds us that we are all suffering from a wound, the wound of vulnerability. I would say, the anthropological wound of mortality that emerges in situations of illness, pain, sorrow, grief, abandonment, exclusion. And yet, in the last episode of Wakefield, we are confronted with a symbolic scene in which Nick and the catatonic patient, now free from the hands of the chief nurse, dance at the edge of the abyss. Put it bluntly, even when you have to take care of someone, you are also hit by your own fragility. The awareness of this vulnerability may be understood in a negative or in a positive sense. It is a wound, and at the same time, 
It opens the door to an interpretation of human existence as a complex web of caring and being cared. Our common vulnerability may lead human beings to be drawn into the web or to dance at the edge of it, even if that dance is precarious. My presentation will focus on the awareness of our common vulnerability as the ground to build an ethics of care. I will follow the road with Judith Butler's notion of vulnerability and precariousness as guides for my reflection about the possibility or the relevance of thinking about the ethics of care. As we know, Butler's development of the concept of precariousness, of vulnerability, has a connection with a reflection about 9-11. In Precarious Life, published in 2004, and in Frames of War, a book from 2009, a main question is, who is grievable? Who deserves to be grieved? Those questions have to do directly with the fact that after 9-11, there seem to exist two weights and two measures in what concerned mourning. The American victims of this unquestionably brutal terror attack and the Afghanistan civilians, victims of the American reaction to the attack. Butler puts the decisive question, what counts as a livable life and a grievable death? Our aim in this conference, in this colloquium, is to think of vulnerability and precariousness as notions that can only be used to describe not only sporadic situations and to see if they are or not, or maybe ontological notions, that is, notions that describe human being as such. The question is if we are discussing a sandstorm or a statue made of clay an unexpected and sporadic event, or a piece of work still fragile, still precarious, but existing in time, even if in a limited time. In that sense, I would like to follow Butler's path about the possibility of framing vulnerability and precariousness in the imponderables of our day-to-day -day life, in sickness and in health, in desperate situations, and in creative ideals that enable us to keep hope, to go on dancing, even if at the edge of an abyss. And yet this formulation may be insufficient or superficial, since 2020 we, are, we were forced to recall that the possibility of being confronted with our precariousness in a brutal way was, is not something remote and unlikely, it means something that we cannot consider just as an imponderable situation from our day to day life. COVID-19 pandemic that started in 2020, as we know, and the war in Ukraine caused by the Russian invasion, a conflict that started in February of 2022 and keeps on without a solution in sight, taught and teaches that not to speak about the climate changes and their impacts on vast regions of the world with catastrophic consequences for the populations, especially for the impoverished ones. So Christine Zanfi's sentence, there's a final line between sanity and madness that I chose to start this presentation with, seems to be translatable into the awareness of the fine line between safety and vulnerability. Actually, while I started preparing this presentation, and the colloquium was really very well organized because I received the invitation uh, one year before the colloquium, and so I sent my abstract. COVID was, of course, something still very present in our minds, but war in Europe was something that still seemed to be out of our near horizon, at least in European, it was something that seemed very, very, very um, uncommon, so to say, at least for the common citizens that we are. Both situations also demonstrate the volatility of life. Sometimes vulnerability and precariousness reveal themselves indeed in micro experiences 
at the times in macro experiences and in some occasions in our current times for instance simultaneously in micro and in macro experiences nowadays Butler's reflection about the establishment or of those lives that can be marked as lives and those deaths will count as deaths echoes in our minds with a different significance. She wrote, thinking about the American reaction to 9-11, as I've already said, now in the sequence of COVID and in the middle of a war that always has and will have serious impacts all over the world, we can keep asking ourselves whose lives can be marked as lives and whose deaths will count as deaths. So I'm preparing this presentation and rereading Butler's books, especially Precarious Life, as I've already said, Friends of War, and notes toward the performative theory of assembly. I won't be able to speak a lot about the last one, sorry. I must, because of time. I must say that her, her texts appear to me as thoughts, reflections, and ethical questions very accurate and relevant to the development of an ethic of care in the present context of insecurity, unsafenessness, traumatic and post-traumatic experiences. However, this is not just a sad coincidence. But the thought about vulnerability considers that this represents our ontological, ontological condition. It is something that emerges in brutal and scary ways in particularly difficult times, but it is what we are, vulnerable. However, even if that is true, Butler's notion of vulnerability does not reflect a pessimistic ontology. On the contrary, she challenges us to think about it with both as something that appeals to the recognition of humanity, a very, very human being, and to an ontological openness to the other. So my proposal is that while hearing the text I'm sharing with you, and thank you for your patience, um, so let us keep in mind as a frame for it, both this ontological condition and our experiences, the multiple and various experiences during COVID, the current situation of war in Europe, the various waves of migration, refugees, for instance. And I will not talk directly about these situations. It seems to me that we are very aware of them if we want to look to our world with open eyes. We know there is an abyss that we may be at the edge of an abyss, but we have to try to keep dancing at the edge, not because we are alien to what is happening, but because vulnerability also represents a chance to recognize that we all share the same condition. We are not alone. So let us just try to translate what Judy Butler wrote into these contemporary situations and keep them in our minds during the reflection I'm sharing with you. Let us follow a path, framing it in 2022. After or still COVID, as I've already said, and while there is a, a war in Europe, as I've already said also, uh, in which refugees, thousands of refugees, are running away from violence, totally exposed to it and to uncertainty. Uh, by assuming this approach, I will also try to make my own reflection resonate as a kind of a jazz improvisation. I don't, I don't, uh, I like jazz very much. I don't play jazz, okay, but I, <laughs> I like it very much. So, a kind of a jazz improvision that starts with the repetition of the main melodic line and elaborates a kind of a response or derivation to it. And then I hope to be able to return to the main melodic line at the end. As I already mentioned, the key issue for Butler's ethics relies in a question. Who counts as human? The answer is connected with the common experience of loss. Everyone lost someone. Everybody made in a way or another. 
the experience of the vulnerability of our bodies in grief managed by something that was is far beyond our possibility of control. Therefore, we experience a vulnerability that is ontological, but also social and embodied. We are socially constituted bodies, says Judith Butler, attached to others, at risk of losing those attachments, exposed to others, at risk of violence by virtue of that exposure. Usually, this exposure to others in our mourning expressions resulting from the loss of someone we love produces a change, a transformation over time in a way that may be still unknown and that will reveal itself in the future. It may express itself in the question, who am I without you? Even if, if we think that this question and the pain attached to it is private, actually, according to Butler, it is political. That is, it furnishes a sense of political community, bringing to the fore the relational ties that have implications for theorizing fundamental dependency and ethical responsibility. Grief is therefore a kind of a string that connects us, a relational thread. Everyone lost someone. This connection means that we live in a web of interdependencies. The recognition of vulnerability in face of others that are also vulnerable opens the possibility of relationality. Since vulnerability is not only a specific situation, as I've said, it is a constitutive of human beings living in the world. Butler thinks it is possible to consider it an ongoing normative dimension of our social and political lives also. It is at the root of ethics and it, should, it should be at the root of political organization of societies. We are all vulnerable bodies. However, our vulnerability should not be considered by others also vulnerable, but often afraid of recognizing that condition as giving them the right to endure us, to dispose of us, to abuse our bodies in situations of violence or of a Darwinistic medical negligence, for instance. In fact, Judith Butler thinks that vulnerability is previous to experiences of vulnerability even prior to individuation itself. Since we are bodies exposed to some set of primary others from the beginning till the end of our lives. At this point, I would like to quote a piece of Butler's text that really seemed to be written for our days. And it was written in her book, Precarious Life. We are all vulnerable to those we are too young to know and to judge, and hence vulnerable to violence, but also vulnerable to another range of touch, a range that includes the eradication of our being at the one end and the physical support of our lives at the other. Actually, Butler's starting question, who is grievable, does not only make sense as a question about the invisibles that were victims of American bombs, all her books about ethics and about its relation with bodies put the same question about bodies that are considered as if they do not exist. That is, bodies that are not, that are turned invisible. Bodies from excluded people, from sexual, religious and cultural minorities. Bodies of old people. Bodies that do not fit into the notion of a human body bodies hiding or hidden, giving many times secretly a shape to the water. This, the, shape, the shape of the water is a very interesting film. I don't know if you saw it, but it has to do with these things and with other things that Butler also explores. However, invoking those bodies is not enough to include them into what Judith Butler considers an established ontology. 
she claims for an insurrection at the level of ontology. An ontology that starts by questioning what is real, whose lives are real, who has the right to be buried, who takes from our from other the right to be buried. Invisible bodies, bodies that were turned into invisible bodies, are already unburied, even if they are alive. And they may be considered unburiable both in life and in death. There is no room, no grave for them. And yet it is the recognition of a common vulnerability previous to the formation of I that transforms vulnerability into this insurrect ontology, a critical opening up to the questions that unbury the invisible bodies and struggle to recognize them, the ontological right to be visible and to be buried, the right to be humanized. However, if we would be able to grieve all human lives, and on the other side, if we would be stuck to the, into the sense of loss, a passive and powerless sense of loss, we would not be able to return to a sense of human vulnerability that would compel us to our collective responsibility for the physical lives and of one another. An active grieving turns grief into a source, a resource for politics, a slow process by which we develop a point of identification with suffering itself, an apprehension of a common human vulnerability. This means that while talking about this common human vulnerability, there is still the need to take into account the existence of a struggle for recognition. The invisibilization of some bodies express the existence of a differential field of power, of a differential operation of norms of recognition. According to Butler, this does not exempt the need to keep speculating about the formation of the subject, since this seems to be crucial in order to achieve a theory of collective responsibility that will not mean a radically inadequate care. It is necessary to acknowledge the existence of theories of power and recognition that foster dependence on a set of norms of recognition that may be impoverishing, violent or abusive, that may even put ourselves in the position of being the model of the human. The risk of falling into this temptation is to adopt the position of the ones who decide who is grievable and who is not. In fact, Judith Butler's ontology does not only presuppose that there is an I that addresses other and or that addressing the others is always successful. She considers that, and I'm quoting, what binds us morally has to do with how we are addressed by others in ways that we cannot avert or avoid. This impeachment by the other's address constitutes us first and foremost against our will, or perhaps put more appropriately prior to the formation of our will. But the distance herself from an understanding of moral authority according to an unilateral, more precisely, a modern notion of autonomy, even if she does not mention it explicitly in this passage of a text about precarious life. I quote her again, if we think that moral authority is about finding one's will, it may be that we miss the very mode by which moral demands are relayed. There is, that is, we miss the situation of being addressed, the demand that comes from elsewhere, sometimes a nameless elsewhere, by which our obligations are articulated and pressed upon us. It is at this point that Butler introduces her own reading of Levinas, more specifically of his notion of the face, an irre irreducible moral claim that comes from the outside of us, that we do not ask for, that we are not free to refuse, unless we want to put ourselves in the position of a murderer, 
or of an accomplice of his death. Erasing the face of the other would mean to deny what Levinas considered the most basic mode of responsibility. Commenting Levinas' understanding of the face, Butler wrote, writes, the face exposed simultaneously what is precarious in another life, or rather, the precariousness of life itself. However, this exposing of the precariousness of life, expressed in the irreducibility of a face, does not mean that this face would work like a mirror to us, in which we would see our precariousness and then make an internal movement towards understanding the precariousness of the others. No, we are not at the center of this reasoning. Who is at the center is the other and the challenge it puts to us. The radical challenge is to decide if the precariousness of the other will lead me to fall into the temptation of killing him or will move me to make peace with him. At the origin of that decision, according to Levinas and to Butler's reading of his philosophy of the face, is a voice that is not human. It is not the voice of a face that may be speechless, although be speaking an agony an injurability. The face of the other produces a struggle inside of us, a struggle between this impulse to kill, to take advantage of someone else's precariousness in order to, pre to, to protect our own precariousness and the prohibition to do it. This voice does not belong to the face. The voice that B speaks an agony, according to Levinas, is the voice that B speaks a divine prohibition against healing. The face of the other interrupts the narcissistic circle. It opens the possibility of an ethical thinking that recognizes vulnerability as an ontological condition that no one will be able to erase from the face of the earth. Butler's interpretation of the emphasis that Levinas puts in the face and in the prohibition of killing is aware of the difficult questions it raises. One of them results from its frame. He speaks from the point of view of a diet, but in the sphere of politics there are always more than two subjects. What if violence is perpetrated against someone we love? How shall we bring together an ethical purpose of not killing with menaces against that someone? Can I invoke the imperative to preserve the life of the other, even if I cannot invoke this right of self-preservation of my life? It seems difficult to find all the answers formulated by Butler about this notion of the face and of the other as an ethical locus. However, she thinks that Levinas opens the way to think about the relationship between representation and humanization, since according to her, it may well be in the domain of representation where humanization and dehumanization occurs ceaselessly. With this sentence, Judith Butler opens an interesting question about the use of the face that is a manipulative way, uh, for instance, within the media. The main question is, how do we come to know the difference between the inhumane and but humanizing face for Levinas and the dehumanization that can also take place through the face? If we take the notion of humanization and dehumanization from the point of view of the chance to gain representation, we can say that those who have the chance to represent themselves may have the temptation to establish who will be treated as less human or even who will be presented as dehumanized. In few words, who will disappear from our sight? who will be turned invisible. On the other side, showing the face may also become a violence. 
Butler gives the example of the exposition of faces of the enemy as if they are spoils of war. But that is not the point of Levinas, since for him the human is not represented by the face. In Butler's words, the human is indirectly affirmed in that very disjunction that makes representation impossible, and this disjunction, this disjunction, this sorry, is conveyed in the impossible representation. For representation to, to convey the human, then representation must not only fail, but it must show its failure. There is something irrepresentable that we nevertheless seek to represent, and the paradox must be retained in the representation we give. The human is beyond the representation we have and make of him or her. I would say no picture, no photo is able to frame, to freeze a human being. No life, no grief, no pain can be captured through a picture. A picture is just a glance. Actually, sometimes a picture is like a shot. So the word is even used in photography. It's like a shot that is the moment that the camera starts rolling until the moment it stops. The continuous footage or sequence between two edits or cuts. A consummation of our own inhumanity. In Frames of War, Butler gets back to the insufficiency of a visual apprehension of a life to form a necessary precondition for an understanding of the precariousness of life. The book, so this one, The Friends of War, written after, after Precarious Life, resumes the topics of grievability and of precariousness already explored in the previous book, while specifying some of them and introducing a new concept, the concept of effect. In Frames of War, Butler asserts that precariousness and precarity are intersecting concepts. Actually, the notion of precariousness that appeared in precarious life could be understood almost as a synonym of vulnerability. In Frame of War, Butler does not refer as often to vulnerability and considers precariousness and precarity as intersecting concepts, saying that we are all precarious, but there are politically induced conditions uh, in which certain populations suffer from failing social and economic networks of support and become differentially exposed to injury, violence and death as a result of an unequal distribution of wealth and of differential ways of exposing certain populations racially and nationally conceptualized to greater violence. In that sense, precarity maximizes precariousness, a feature that is common to all human beings, as I have already seen, but that is exacerbated by structures of power. The recognition of a shared precariousness should introduce strong normative commitments of equality and invite a more robust universalization of rights that seek to address basic human needs for food, shelter and other conditions for persisting and flourishing. In the chapter of Friends of War, with the titles Survivability, Vulnerability, Effect, Judith Butler considers that the postulation of a generalized precariousness calls into question the ontology of individualism. According to her, it's not enough to recognize that life is precarious and therefore it must be preserved. The conditions that render life sustainable should also be improved. By saying that she's making critique and at the same time a political statement an approach to precariousness that would only understand the situation and this notion as an individual situation or condition 
may risk to undermine the definition of political measures to ameliorate those situations in which precariousness actually becomes precarity. Precariousness cannot be used as a kind of an alibi for social inequalities. Therefore, Butler's ontology of the body serves as a point of departure for thinking about social and political responsibility. However, thinking of an ontology based in the body does not mean that it persists per se, since in order to be, the body needs to rely on what is outside itself. The body is vulnerable, dependent from a sustainable or unsustainable world. The task of responsiveness, of responsibility, is located in the effective response, the response is effective, not effective, also effective, but talking about effective, responsible responses to a sustaining and impinging world. To put it shortly, moral theory has to become social critique. That is why Butler clearly appeals to a notion of responsibility that is not individual. We are bound to, uh, to others. It is not possible to think of an I without that world of others. At the end of the day, responsibility turns an I into a we. Better, it uncovers what we could call a relational ontology. If I exist, it is because there are others. It is obvious that their existence may include the possibility of violence, of destruction, but it also includes the notion of a common precariousness. But the concludes, in this sense, we are all precarious lives. Nevertheless, there is still a question that actually is at the root of the ethics of care right from the beginning of its formulations. For instance, if we look to a, a book that uh, there was also a short film um, in the program and in the site of the colloquium, um, and it, it was a sentence of Virginia Health, she was one of the first authors, uh, as we know, so after Carol Ely, and so they talked about the ethics of care. And the question is, how shall we consider each and every human being as someone we are responsible for? Butler goes even further and brings once more into our discussion the regulatory power that creates a divide between those who are concerned with and those we are not even considering as human beings, those who are out of our sight, those whose lives and deaths simply do not touch us, or do not appear as lives at home, a core topic of precarious life, as we have already seen. Then how is it possible to feel affected, not only by lives from the others we love, but also by the lives of those we do not know? How are we to have an effective response and moral evaluation that is aware of the existence of a previous framework that establishes who is worthy of protection while others are not, precisely because they are not but lives, according to prevailing norms of recognizability. Judith Butler considers that the only way to overtake these questions is to perceive loss, to feel affected by loss. But this, this will only be possible if the social structures of perception the social supports for feeling recognize all human beings as precarious, all of them. And since we live and were born in a specific social frame, if in that frame all human lives are considered to be grievable, there is a possibility of de developing an effective response to vulnerability, to precariousness or precariousness um, of our own bodies. In fact, in Butler's own words, the boundary of who I am is the boundary of the body, but the boundary of the body never fully belongs to me. Survival depends less on the established boundary to the self 
than on the constitutive sociality of the body. But as much as the body considered as a social in both its surface and death is the condition of survival, it is also that which under certain conditions, social conditions, imperils our lives and our survivability. Nevertheless, as Butler says in notes to other performative theory of the 70s, so uh, the third book, a book I will not have time to explore here. Living is always living in sociality. In that sense, the life of the other, the life that is not our own, is also our life. From the start, we are dependent on the world of others constituted in and by a social world. That is why Butler thinks that the ethical relation is structured fundamentally by a mode of address. You call upon me and I answer. But if I answer, it's not only because I was already answerable. That is, the sensibility and vulnerability constitutes me at the most fundamental level and is there, we might say, prior to any deliberate decision to answer the call. In other words, one has to be already capable of receiving the call before actually answering it. In this sense, ethical responsibility presupposes ethical responsiveness. Getting back to the story, and I'm finishing, I told at the beginning of this presentation, acknowledging our common vulnerability should lead us to try to find ways to dance at the edge of an abyss without slipping and falling into it, while it is still possible to dance, since not falling does not mean obviously that we have the capacity to abolish that possibility. Actually, falling will be inevitable one day, or else we will put ourselves in a position of immortality. Dancing at the edge of the abyss has much more to do, on one hand, with the awareness of what vulnerability means, and on the other hand, with seeing it as a sign of hope. Nick, the psych nurse of the story I told at the beginning, was not alone while he was dancing. He danced with someone else, someone who was also aware of the experience of being vulnerable and yet made the effort of dancing with Nick. Not a tragic dance, but a joyful one. At that precise moment, they danced taking care of each other in order not to fall. Caregiver and care receiver were united in the recognition of their common vulnerability. Nick was not only a caregiver, he was also a care receiver. Are we not all in both positions? Thank you so much.